black children see cartoons with the lynch mobs and they they laugh at it and they don't even know that you know these lynch mobs that are shown in these cartoons were the same mobs that used to come and get you know innocent black people out of their homes black women black men black children um, and then they they never change like the the people within the mob will change but the the reminiscent of the mob won't like you'll always see a torch you'll see a straw hat you'll see one of the, one of the characters with maybe like a piece of straw or something in their mouth and and, and they have the pitchforks and they're like get them take them down you know whenever the character in the cartoon is doing something goofy or funny and and it's like black children don't even know they're laughing at their own oppression so it, it starts early and and then now as they get older i mean as of now in, in this 21st century i always refer to the music the music and the tv shows that's what's shaping our you know black youth mind now you know at least that's what i see um I, I did something in my class i showed my students how the music it promotes violence there was a podcast that a rapper, older rapper by the name of Crazy Bone did where he was talking about the music industry and how, you know, uh, there was a letter circulating. You know, it was it was big things online, whether if, whether if this letter was, you know, real, you know, if it was like something somebody made up or something like that. But the letter, it had facts in it. Um, there it was it was supposed to be by a music exec, a decision maker within music in 1991. And he talks about a meeting he attended. And in this meeting, he talks about how he met with these men who was dressed in these black suits. They never disclosed their name, who they were, uh, who they worked with, where they came from. And they, they were talking about how they were gonna use the music industry to promote criminal behavior and activity in the black community to promote the private prison industry and system. And what they would do is use the music to influence this criminal behavior so that, that they can send you know, the consumer, when the consumer listens to the music, commits a crime, they can send that consumer to their private prisons and how, they, how the private prison industry would pay these record companies. So you know, when you look at it, when we look at entertainment, in America, there's always been an attack on black people. The first forms of entertainment were minstrel shows in this country. Um, so I, I find it very intriguing, you know, when, you know, we as black people, we tend to watch a TV show, watch a movie, listen to a song. And a lot of times the first thing we say is, well, it's only entertainment. No, it's actually not. Entertainment has agendas. And I think that's something that we don't understand. Um, and that's something we, we are constantly attacked by mainstream media. I can't hear you, Minister Brown. M Minister Brown, I think you're on mute. Can you bring me on? Can you unmute me? I can hear you now, Minister Brown. Okay, good. All right, we have been, we have just been, John, let me put my glasses on. Um, oh, oh, Mawali. Yes, sir. How hey, you doing? It's, good, it's good to have you, brother. Yes, sir. Now, I appreciate the opportunity to be back. Yeah, you, 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 you came in on the end of Brother Miller. And what we're talking about is how early the um, processing of our young people's mind began in terms of the pipeline from school to prison or from the music industry to prison, but how uh, the system begins to process the intellect, uh, the mind of black folk for prison at, at earlier and earlier 
ages because the prison is a private industrial complex that makes millions of dollars. Uh, and so Brother Miller was just laying out how they use our music and our culture to sow the seeds of, um, of criminality uh, in our young people's mind, but they don't know it. They, they don't realize they're being programmed uh, right. to uh, hurt each other, um, to destroy their own culture, uh, and being set up for the industrial prison complex. So, I mean, this is also a subject that you are familiar with and has uh, spoke on in the past. So even though you're just coming on, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is actually one of my favorite subjects or, or things that I actually speak to people about because... Um, Man, Brother Miller, I got to say, uh, I'm actually happy to be on here with you because I, I did catch a panel before that you were on with uh, Nefer Najai and my brother uh, Dexter. So, like, um, connection there already, man. And uh, I appreciate all the work that you do as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, my opinion, uh, my sentiments actually echo a lot of what Brother Miller has said. Um one quote that really stood out to me years ago, as far as when you talked about entertainment having an agenda, um, is I believe I was watching Dr. Ray Hagen's some years ago, and he was talking about the word uh, amusement. And it's something that ever since I've heard it, I had to keep on telling people, I had to go preach it to somebody else because I was like, y'all really aren't understanding the etymology of all the words that we use. Um, so, so he, he just broke it down from how uh, amusement is a simile for entertainment, but it's amusement where like the root of that is muse, which means to think, and then amuse, just like as if you were asymptomatic to COVID or whatever, then you don't have it. So amuse is to mean to, to not provoke thought. So I always tell, I ask my friends, I'm like, if you're sitting here watching TV all the time, or if you're on social media as your entertainment, not with a positive intent with it, to use it, not let it use you, then uh, you're being provoked not to think. And therefore, if you're not thinking, then you're dead. Because I mean, I've been, I've heard multiple times that uh, man equals mind. <laughs> so if you're not even using it, and what are you? And what are you like? What are you doing with your life? And to the point of some of our recent conversations around our entertainers and whatnot, uh, we just had the Grammys. Um, and so I like, I, 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 I don't even understand why we even talk about the Grammys anymore. Um, to the point where I know brother Dale Jones, uh, ancestor. Now he used to speak on a concept called the American nigger factory and then speech from arrested development some years ago had a, a whole video compilation of the nigger factory and just explaining exactly what brother Miller was saying, how, our music has been compromised. It's been co-opted since, since possibly ever since every time they took something from ever since, since blues, like moving to rock and roll, uh, the the our bebop, like moving into you have disco, or he, like, you then you move into rap, and everybody didn't like hip hop and rap at first, but it was protest music at first. It was something to galvanize the youth, but then once uh, it seemed as though the people that started to commercialize a revolutionary music and everything seemed to change, at least from my personal experience and from what I've been watching from other people, like other ancestors or other master teachers talking about it. Where I've had a conversation with a sister who says that she's a fourth wave feminist and she's a scholar, like she's an educator, like she's teaching in college and whatnot and she's a professor. And I had a conversation with her about uh, Cardi B, where she even said, like, when she actually spits real bars, people don't listen to her music. But when she actually starts over-sexualizing things, then people listen to her music. And I was trying to use that as saying she knows that it's a, it's a game to it. That may not actually be what she really actually wants to rap about, but she understands that that's what's going to make her money or that's what's going to draw the attention of people. Like, everything's over-sexualized now. You, you have the youth, as y'all talking about, is getting, they're getting attacked earlier. Like they're being open to sexualized themes a lot younger than where 
they I believe personally that they should be. And that plays into that whole preschool to prison pipeline system, as Dr. Evandra said um, this past weekend. And I don't necessarily myself, I don't even listen to our our music anymore because I'm still personally trying to become as centered in my African thinking as I possibly can. So I know that I have to have I have to what's the word I'm looking for? I have to curtail where or I have to wait, what's the word I'm looking for? I have to be the alchemist of my algorithm, essentially. Like I have to control what goes into my nutrition and make sure that I'm not necessarily taking in anything that's destructive to the progression of our people, or I'm not listening to somebody that's owned by uh, another ethnicity or another people that doesn't really care about my people or the progression of us. Um, Cause it just seems as though everything that we put out has to be negative now, but the people that control what's being put out aren't even really in our community. So I, I definitely agree with what brother Miller was saying. Brother Miller, basically this conversation is between the two of you. We're waiting on Dr. Jeffries, who is going to be speaking on <clears throat> the crucial, uh, 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 the crucial, I, I guess, uh, work that Sheikh Anta Diab did and how it has impacted the thinking of black folks around the world and not just black folk, but the entire world, because he literally uh, laid out for us uh, how Europeans came into being. Um, uh, so we're waiting, and nobody knows uh, uh, Sheikh Under Diop's work better, I think, than Dr. Jeffries. So we're waiting on him. But meanwhile, we are enjoying. Uh, I should say enjoying, but we are learning. Um, we are learning uh, in-depth information on how we are processed from infants, and and infant is the right word, from infancy uh, in preparation to control uh, our mind and imprison our body. So we are we are listening to uh uh these two brothers brother miller and uh brother akande uh tell us about their experience and their work and uh how hip-hop and all other music really uh our black people have been uh for the most part the the music is um is is captured and white people try to duplicate it and call it their music if you look at um uh Elvis presley uh any of them i mean you know they took they could not sing exactly like black people so what they did was they they took their invitations of black folk and created a category uh, for themselves that sound as close as they could to what black people really sound like. And then they gave that a category in which they could win uh, the awards and everything. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I just want to throw this out so you, you can see more in depth what I'm talking about. If you took jazz and white folk now claim that jazz is as much their creation as it is black people, but jazz is a communication. It's a dialogue between the creator and, and black folk who were, and especially black men and black women uh, as well, but black men who were un who was under so much pressure and under so much tyranny um, that they talk with the creator directly. And the creator 
spoke back to them. And it came out in the form of this music we call jazz. But, you know, if you start listening at it, you know, uh, at uh, Coltrane, uh, any of them, you see that, you know, <clears throat> going deep <clears throat> and deeper. <clears throat> And deeper, it's a conversation that they were having with the creator. And they blew it out. And white people really had nothing to do with it. Because they were not a part of the conversation. That you listen at, that we call jazz, is the conversation between the oppressed, between black folk, and their creator as they call for relief, as they, you know, it's just like, why are you letting this happen? Why, you know, it's, it's a dialogue. And that's what we're listening at. Um, and we have been uh, joined by my sister. Um, she's she try, try, trying to get in. Uh, Darrell, can you get uh, Mama Ashe? Can you get her with us? Um, uh, who do we have? That some other folk that's come, coming in with us. Um, I'm pleased to have everybody with us this morning. And uh, if you uh, brothers would continue uh, with us uh, to dialogue on this subject, I appreciate it. Okay, I'm a little bit late. Uh, peace and blessings to everybody. And what what's the the, uh, the subject? Uh, it's my apologies. No, the subject is looking at from the pipeline to the prison, and how our young people are being targeted more and more at a younger and younger age to. Um, to almost, we could say, from the cradle to the prison uh, because uh, the black man uh, must be uh, stopped, conquered, defeated by the European who has done this, I would say, since Job. I want to use, use that biblical passage, Job, even though... Um, you may not look at religion, um, but I don't throw the bathwater out because all these religions come from us. They are all fragments of uh, African understanding of the universe. And I say fragments of African understanding of the universe. So uh, having been in the ministry, uh, and having brought about these sermons uh, and having seen in them how they come out of us anyway. Uh, that Bible verse with Job, where, uh, where Job is born a perfect and upright man. Uh, but the devil who wanted to be like Job or to be Job to take his place and we have that uh, in our history when you look at uh, uh, opposites, you know, how they play out and so forth. Um, but Job had to go to God in order to get permission to attack Job. And uh, when all of the children came before God and Job showed up and God asked Job where he'd been. He said, hey, man, I've been to and fro the land looking at, uh, you know, all your people and everything. And God said, have you considered my, uh, my son Job? He said, yeah, but you got a hedge built around him. Uh, and if you took the hedge out around him, shit, I'd, I'd make that nigga curse you before your face. And beg to die. So the creator said, all right, you know, he's yours. Just don't touch his life. 
And so here it was a perfect man, perfect in all his ways and was blessed as one of the most blessed beings on the planet. God, in order to prove his intelligence, in order to prove his obedience and his faithfulness, let him to Satan. Said, okay, Satan, you got him. Just don't touch his life. And Satan, uh, as we were, uh, and you got to look at who Satan is, because this is the story of black folk. We were, we were created here in a perfect state. Uh, everything came through us, knowledge, mathematics, building of the pyramids. I mean, we did everything. Uh, but everything was allowed to be taken from us so that uh, the world could see how to be perfect and upright and how uh, our faith in our creator would could not be tampered with or uh, we could not be destroyed. And so Job took everything away. I mean, even Job's friends say, why don't you just curse God and die? Because we, we've been through it, brother. I mean, we, we've we been through it uh, where everybody around the world kind of said, you know, slavery has not been a joke. Why don't you just curse God and die? Uh, but we have, uh, we've stood fast. And at the that struggle and Job stood fast. The creator blessed him even greater than he was blessed before. And this is the time of the black man. We built, we gave the world the calendar, the 365, and we also gave the world the 26,000 year calendar, which we call the Zodiac. And that time right now in the earth is the time of Cephas, which is the Ethiopian star, rise of the black man, the Ethiopian star. This is our time, the energy that's being put into the earth. The creator is restoring us greater than he did when he called us first into humanity. We are being restored right now to save the earth, to leadership. And we must understand that and not be afraid to lead. So we're the lions in the earth. But we can't be afraid to be the lion. You got to be it. You got the creator in you who leads you, who guides you, who's restoring you. So, hey, brother, let's not be afraid. Let's roar. It's our time. So that's my little contribution right now. I'm uh, enjoying uh, you, brothers. So uh, uh, I just want you to continue, uh, Director Professor Berger. Well, well, you know, the funny thing is, it's like now I hope I hope the rail ain't, ain't, ain't the feds because when he when he hit me up, and then I pop in on here after what I just got finished doing. And I'm going to tell you what I was doing. And then we could have been talking about a whole bunch of other stuff, right? But then when you started talking about the religion and everything, I was like, uh-oh. Because I just got off the phone with um, Brother Booker T. Washington, Baba Kaba. Yeah. Yeah, I just got off the phone with him. And uh, let me show you that I ain't, I don't know if y'all can see this, show you that I ain't lying. <laughs> so I don't know if y'all can see that. Right. Yeah. All right. So, and you know, uh, well, let me first say, let me, let me go back. Peace and blessings, brother Clemson. Peace and blessings, uh, peace and blessings, brother uh, Oluku, and Omawali. Uh, shout out to y'all. All right. And my name is Nawari. So, how how are you guys doing? Okay. We're doing fine. All right, right. Good, brother. You can continue. So, all all right. Right. so. So as I as I um, so I'm a uh, I don't know if you remember Brother Clemson I'm a history teacher and um, adjunct professor and now um, a you know a filmmaker um, just started doing film and stuff and, and you know we we talked about that before but look y'all 
Look, I'm working on a whole bunch of stuff, right? And if y'all can see this, one of them is called, right? That's the name of the film, right? And yeah. so, could y'all read that? Our God is Black? <laughs> hey, hey. So, so I just got off, the, uh, off the, with, with speaking to Baba Kaba, and the, it's, it's centered around, the film is centered around when, when, when um, Michael uh, from Good Times puts up the image of Black Jesus, and supposed to be Ned DeWino, puts Jesus on the wall. The brother Omawali, I don't know age-wise, if you remember uh, Good Times or if you know that episode. I got the reruns, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, so that's a classic episode. So I'm working on trying to get Rob Carter, who played Michael, and uh, Bernadette Stannis, who played Thelma, to talk about that piece, right? To talk about that, because that changed my whole trajectory as a kid. Even though I had my, 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 my mom's and my pops in my ear about that, but yeah. the, the, the centerpiece of the film is called Our God is Black. Um, and with that imagery, you know, the Rastafarians, the Moors, the, the nation of gods and earths, the Hebrew Israelites, the Ifa Yoruba system, the Nuwapians, um, we could go on and on. Um, we're debunking the idea of a, of a, of a white deity. That's pretty much the, 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 the centerpiece. And so in that spirituality of, 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 of when you talked about Job, when you talked about uh, the Bible, um, what's also important is understanding the roots and culture of where these ideas come from. And so this is where, what the piece is gonna be about, um, where we're talking about the positives of the Hebrew Israelites and people have issues with some of their doctrine, but the positives, the positives of the nations of God's and earth. When we say peace, that comes from them. The positives of the Rastafarian, um, even though they look to Selassie as a deity, it's a black deity. Um, they've been talking about CMOS way before anybody was talking about CMOS 30, 40 years ago. Meditation, you know, instead of calling each other the N word or the B word, you know, peace God, peace queen, greetings empress, you know, hotel, these positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. So what are the positives that come out of these spiritual systems, which ideologically um, is rooted in the opposition to a white uh, deity? So I'm hoping to be able to speak to, um, um, so I'm, I'm putting all that together. Uh, I hit up Anthony Browder. Um, I hit up, um, uh, like I say, Baba Kaba, he's on. And so um, I hope to speak to the brother at Great Abyssinia Baptist Church in Harlem, um, Reverend Calvin Butts. Um, because if you know Great Abyssinia, Holly Selassie brought the cop to cross Great Abyssinia years ago. Um, and so it's not about subscribing to any specific religion or culture, but it's about all the positives, like the meditation, what Dr. York brought to the Nuwapians, brought to um, to everybody. So, um, and believe it or not, um, and I don't want to, you know, like we, I don't want to stereotype any of us, but we sometimes speak to the choir. But the general population of Black people, some of them never heard of Nation Gods or Earth, never, they don't know who the Moors are, the Hebrew Israelites are. You go to certain places out West, down South, um, here, even here, they don't, they don't know about these. So these, these people are powerful people and they brought us the idea to think about um, a deity um, that reflects our image. And so that affects the school to prison pipeline, maybe abstractly, you know, but it, all of those things affect, you know, the higher power and the imagery of the higher power. So I'm hoping to have this project um, with all these other projects I'm working on, black beaches, all the black beaches around America, we don't know about like different things. I'm working on a show. I didn't want to come on, but when you said that for the country, I was like, man, I hope the world wasn't listening in. <laughs> no, I, I know that. I know better than that. But, you know, it, it's, it's crazy that I just got off of Baba Kaba and we were talking about, you know, uh, the imagery of white Jesus over in Africa, which is, which is, um, if, unbelievable. If, yeah, yeah, about that, and um, and how can we, you know, because I, what I said the Baba Kaba is, and I've said this before, and people will will say, well, you know why? What the answer to this question is that you asked? But I always say, how come 
T.D. Jakes, Tyler Perry, and Oprah Winfrey haven't put their money together to come up with the, a black, a, an epic Black Jesus film. Um, so and we might already know the answer to that. So um, maybe they're already working on it. Maybe, you know, but uh, we know this, this is something that needs to be talked about. And it's not about denigrating anybody's uh, religion or culture, because um, if I do this film the way I would like it to be, everything will be, you know, respected. The black church will be respected, or everything, all the traditions that we're, we're in. Um, I want to parallel Yoruba culture that we see in black church, whether we know it or not. When we're seeing, uh, may not necessarily be 256 uh, Edu, or however many it is in regards to Ifa, but you're seeing cultural things being played out in, in you know, West African stuff in a black church. So, you know, this is all interconnected, you know. Yes. You know, so I'll, I'll stop there. You know, see I'm getting long winded because the, the, we're talking about school to prison pipeline. So um, I'll, you know, I'll defer to so, someone else. I'm a teacher. I teach high school special education right now and as an adjunct professor. So. We can go around and I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, thank you. Um, just join in, Brother uh, Miller. Dr. Jeffers will be with us anytime now. Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we waiting on him. We just decided to go ahead on and have a dialogue uh, while we wait yeah. on him to join us, but he's coming. I should talk uh, to him. Yeah, he, you know he's in the film. He's in the DNA film. And I've been meaning to reach out to him, and I haven't. So I feel bad. I got to reach out to him. But that's great, man. That's that's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Okay. So if I can, uh, if I can intersect, I would say one thing <clears throat> that um, the concept of religion and mm -hmm. who you see as your creator that does affect the pipeline because. Most of our, you know, our youth, you know, they have parents and grandparents and family members who introduce them, you know, to that white image of God. And it goes, it goes two ways. You know, you can see it and you're like, well, I mean, I, I mean, can is God really real? You know what I'm saying? We're suffering. You know, I haven't ate. You know, I ain't ate last night. My homie just got shot. Mm -hmm. So you show mm -hmm. me like Jesus and you telling me to pray to this this image of a white man he looked like the police officer officer to slam my head into the car so it's not making sense to me so now my whole concept of God don't exist because it's like God forgot about me mm -hmm. and then on the other end it, it goes with that white savior complex you know I, I strongly have made this argument multiple times in my classroom that us seeing that white image of, of, of God you know of seeing you know, Jesus as white, it makes us look at white people as saviors. It makes us look at them. And it's like, like, um, you know, like when I go downtown, I'm in Chicago. When I go downtown, right. I always see, you know, the, the homeless black people, they downtown and they have a sympathetic look on their face. And they look at the white people like, man, save me. And, you know, I just make a connection where I'm like, we go downtown and we beg and it's like these people are the reason why we're in the situations that we're in they're the last people who gonna give you <laughs> who gonna give you a quarter a penny a dollar a dime they're the last people who are gonna give you something mm -hmm. so it does lead to that a lot of our youth especially our young males they mm -hmm. their minds are extremely distorted they don't know what to believe who to believe what to know what you know they, they they're just completely distorted mm -hmm. and when they when they do learn the concept of all religions originating in Africa, you know I learned this from John Jackson. This is where mm -hmm. I learned it from. Mm -hmm. um, when they do learn this, you know most of them like seriously you 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 for real. Mm -hmm. You know I never forget the time when I was when I had a mentoring program, fourth grade. I was showing you know you know my 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 young guys. I was showing them Kemet. Everything in yeah. Kemet, where the concept, where all this came from, how they copied the cross from the Ankh, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget a student, he went home, he told his mom he was eager. Mm -hmm. And she approached me with an attitude, with a, with a serious attitude. And she was like, you know, I really like you, Mr. Miller, but 
you know, you don't want to spoil it. And, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, I, you know, I looked at first and I'm like, huh? Then she was like, well, you teaching him that, you know, that, 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 it, you know, that, that the Jesus was based on her rule or whoever you taught him and all this other stuff. And that's not what we believe. And I'm like, okay, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, okay. Like, <laughs> I'm like, you, you, you getting a little too aggressive when he wanted to know the truth. I didn't say that, you know, him being taught what you're teaching him is wrong. I was just showing him where it originated. And it's like, if, if, if we have our young men, you know, being taught these things, you know, like uh, Minister Clemson Brown said, you know, the men, they're the, we're the foundation. We're the foundation of our communities. We're the foundation, you know, of our race. Um, mm -hmm. But if we are looking at another man as a savior, meaning white men, Mm -hmm. How can we live up to full potential of manhood, of warriorhood? Mm -hmm. you know, and and that's where it falls in line to where I make a lot of connections with slavery. It falls in line with that boy mentality. A lot of us black men view ourselves as boys. Mm -hmm. This is why it's hard for us, some of us to grow up. Yeah, to adults. You, you you get what I'm saying? It's like it's mm -hmm. it's very we have we're, we're stuck in that boy mentality. Someone mm -hmm. has to tell us what to do when to do it. This is why some of us like prison. We like being told what to do, when to do it, when to eat, when to sleep, when to go work out, when to read, when to clean up. These are things we don't have that discipline as men. So it, and it goes to that, that image. And, you know, I always say, I find it funny how, you know, we yell nigga, hey, nigga, hey, nigga, nigga, quit playing. But we whisper white people. <laughs> I always yeah. found it funny. We whisper white people. I've been in a room with black people. Oh, man. This is me and them. And they they whisper. They say, because these white folks, why are yeah, you with them? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? And, and, and I go back to making that connection with slavery again. What did, yeah, what did you just say? Yeah, what did Frederick Douglass say? Frederick Douglass said that when he went to the nigger breaker, Edward uh, Covey, mm. he said that he had the ability to make him think that he was always present by mm -hmm. popping up on him. You know what I'm saying? Like unannounced, spontaneously. He can be asleep. He pops up on him. He can be eating, yeah. using the bathroom. So yeah. we have that mentality. We think that white people are going to pop out the walls on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of it is mixed into that image of that pipeline. That's and that's, that's what we see. So that does connect. I know um, Professor is, is Burge or Burger, right? A birds, B B U R G G E, but but the whole point of my film is to eventually change that that European. And I know you. I know you were saying how um you was like uh, you was like you don't know how it connect, and it's like it connect. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because if mm -hmm. our God looks like the same people who are oppressing us, then we're gonna think this is what what we're destined des destined for. You know, mm -hmm. and it goes back like I like I always say to slavery. You mm -hmm. had you know white priests telling. Slave, mm -hmm. and if you feel like you want to be free, that's just the devil tempting you. Mm -hmm. These are the things mm -hmm. that you know, me myself personally, I'm never forgetting. Mm -hmm. How can you tell me it's wrong to want to be free? Let's not even forget about Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who said, If you want to be free, you're mentally insane, you're a drapetomaniac. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. a whole disease about it. Drip so, all man. these things, and mm -hmm. this is why. You know, black brothers like ourselves, like Minister Clemson Brown, like other elders and ancestors. Yeah, you know, that feud is crazy because this is the mentality. Well, well, with Dr. Jeffries, you know, he went through a lot. The brother that brought me into Keene University, Dr. Conyers, um, was under the first chair of Dr. Malefi Asante at Temple University. Um, now he's the chair of, of King. And Dr. Conyers, Dr. Jeffries is tight. I got cool with Dr. Jeffries um, through the film. I always known about him for years, for years, but through the film and everything that he went through in the 90s, um, you know, it was hot uh, in, in, in America, especially, you know, fight the power in 89 and, and the Crown Heights thing and all that that was going on and in the colleges because Dr. Jeffries was, was keeping it 100 um, and what he went through at, uh, at City College. But let me tell you this. Um, so um, my film DNA, it won uh, Best Documentary in Accra, Ghana at the Black Star International Film Festival. It was the first time I ever went to, to Ghana. The, the Right before I was about to go, I'm on the phone with Dr. Jeffries and we talking 
and I'm telling him, thank you for everything. And then we just talking. Then he goes, um, and I mentioned something about religion. And yeah, I heard all, you know, the Jesus and all that. He just shut it down and he, like and went in for two hours about don't even bring that up when you go over there. So yo, I'm 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 when I go to Cape Coast Dungeons, so you gotta go to uh I forget from a crowd, I forget what area you gotta take the um the trotro to this area, and then it's a main like kind of a transportation and people doing comedy, all kind of stuff. And then it's a three hour shot to Cape Coast. On that bus, a revival broke out in Chui, the indigenous, one of the indigenous Ghana language, Chui. Revival, straight revival broke out on the bus, yo. So that's how heavy this is, man. Like, and it's not to, again, take away from that, but, you know, and I'm pretty sure I was talking to Baba Kaba, and I said, Baba Kaba, I don't know how much you um, you follow social media, but y'all probably remember over, I think it was last summer or the beginning of the year in the Congo, Congo or Kenya, it was a white dude. Um, and all the Kenyans was running behind that, that white guy or whatever with the long hair. I don't know if anybody saw that. But, and, and, and this was all on social media. You could probably Google it or YouTube it. But it's serious with the, with the, the white Eurocentric imagery of, you know, and, and it was Dr. Jeffries that was like, listen, you know, and then this is my personal opinion, and I love my people over there. But my man, we I was talking to my man, he was like, we was kicking it. And I said, he was like, yo, so what you think with everything? I was talking about all the stuff going on. I said, wow. I said, I think they're more or less like 18th, late 18th, early 19th century Christians, if that makes any sense. He was like, wow. I said, I said, yeah, at least here we're talking about black Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I said, at least the imagery, we're talking about that. And I'm not saying they're not talking about it over there, but um, you know, you just see the, the you know the pictures of them on buses, on billboards. You know, this cat that looked like Kenny G or something. You know, the guy that used to play the, you know, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, I like that has to be talked about at least. And and like you said, uh, brother o o Olaku, you know what I'm saying? It, it is all all tied in together. But I, I like that uh that analogy. You know, you just drop like. <laughs> Like the white man is like, he like on your shoulder. You know, yeah, I got the left shoulder. What's good? He, he like on your shoulder, you know, and everybody, you know, they're white. And I'm like, why, why do they be whispering white? But because he, he the boogeyman, he right there all the time. So I love that. I love that, 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 uh, that analogy, man. Now, yeah. Dr. Jeffries uh, has John Nuss. Yeah. Uh, Dr. J, can you hear us? Uh, this is not Dr. J's brother Charles. I was getting him set up. I didn't know I was going to come in live with the, with the brothers. It's good to see you all, brothers. Uh, brother Omawali, I saw you the other day. I'm still watching that episode, but I was very impressed by you, young brother. I'm, pr I'm proud to, to see you doing your thing. The other two brothers are local, and Professor Burge, it's good to meet you. Uh, yes, yeah, good to meet yes, you. I, I met you before. It's been, been a minute. Oh, okay. All right. Well, nice to make your reacquaintance, brothers. <laughs> yeah, did, did, were you in, in, in Newark? Um, because I'm in Newark. So, did you come to the um the bookstore last year? Did you bring yes, it? yes, yes, with Doctor J. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that was that was that was I would that was that was me with, with him doing the thing, doing the uh the screening okay. and the lecture and stuff. So, oh, so right. Could I see it? Now, I didn't notice that DNA film. That's right. That's right. Yep. That brother Charles, aka the driver. The driver, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how you doing? How you doing, man? How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good, brother. It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, there you go. I thought I thought Clemson had shut me off. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, it's good to see your brothers. Y'all doing the y'all on the African path. Your ancestors have guided you this way, and they are with you. So I want you all brothers to call on them. Every time, every day when you can. We got, y'all talking about Christianity. One of the greatest crimes with white Christianity is it's taking us away from our connection to our ancestors. Because mm -hmm. it's our ancestors that we we contact our first ancestor, the creator of all things. So y'all call on your ancestors, but I, I, I see y'all and I, I was very impressed with that conversation and the level of thinking in terms of the African community that y'all have. And so, you know, I'm looking for good things for y'all. I'm looking forward to connecting with y'all the way that Dr. J and Brother Swan and the others connected with me. 
so that we can continue this. It's a continuum of struggle with African people. So y'all are a part of it now. Yep. Yeah, You're welcome to it. Me. You're welcome here. Yeah, I was just saying, we just got off. I just got off with Baba Kaba, man. And I was just telling him about this, our God is black thing. And it's going to be about the Moors and all that. And about the spiritual, about uh, Michael. When Michael puts the, the, the white, the black Jesus, Ned the wino puts the black Jesus on the wall. And they had a conversation about black Jesus. So the, the film is going to be centered around that episode, but about the Moors, the Israelites, the Ephi, Yoruba, the Nuwapians, and how our spiritual system, our identity, the Rastas, how we identify with a with a black deity. But um, but Oma uh, Oma Wally, where, where, I wanted to ask you where where, where are you located, uh, brother? Uh, so I'm located in like Metro Atlanta. I teach in Fayetteville, Kalima Montessori. It's like a night. Like right. we pretty much all black. Um, I I'd say, man, I again, man. Y'all are talking about everything that I pretty much see, like um, from my time in public school to being in uh, this Montessori. I teach first through 10th grade, so I kind of get to see the level of thinking throughout the years and whatnot. And my students that I teach, uh, like what you said, um, Brother Miller, like when I teach my, my students that are younger about us, they seem like they're really into it. And like like one of my students, his his father renamed himself Sundiata. So like when we got to the, so when we talked about Sundiata and him being the real Lion King and he was all into it and everything. But then as I get older, cause I'm just now in this environment, um, it seems as though those, those entertainment pieces that we talked about earlier, like my older students in, in the upper level, Man, I got one student, she'll walk, and I, I love all my students. I, I pick at them when they pick at me because we like I, I try to stay on the conscious level and, level and and whatnot while they bringing in mainstream stuff to me. But um, like one of them, she'll literally walk around saying Corvette, Corvette, and I'm <laughs> like, yo, mm -hmm. <laughs> they got you because you you're you're you want like you don't even no, she's never even seen a Corvette. But she mm -hmm. knows like that's now in her vernacular. Now it's something that's been paraded or uh, something to be mm -hmm. to looking forward to in a song and whatnot. So uh, everything mm -hmm. that Charles saying, I it all definitely does tie in because especially when you you mentioned how parents introducing you to God, so it comes that comes a very personal conversation for some people when they come into this information. And I believe you mentioned yeah. something said they feel different. Like that's not how they feel, or that's not what they believe. But that, but mm -hmm. when you bring in the historical facts, or of, of the scholars like Leonard Jeff, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, um, mm -hmm. John Henry Clark, and bring it, bring in the books because now I'm actually ordering the books and bringing them to the school myself too. <laughs> I'm like, I, I gotta have uh, some reinforcements here besides this this uh, IB curriculum that we have here because it's not gonna bring that up at all. So. Right. When you do that, let me, let me make a suggestion to you, brother. Yes, sir. Dr. John Henry Clark and the elders, great though they may be, they may be a little heady for our young people. I would hit them yeah. with something like hip hop versus my eye. Yeah. Visions, okay. visions for black men. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even, um, well, not Stolen Legacy, because Stolen Legacy could be a little difficult. It could be for a more advanced reader. Yeah. But you want to hit them with things at their level. Uh, you know, what would be good for them? Um, there's a when I was a kid, there was a classic comic book series. Uh, Baba Clemson would know what it is about 20, 26 comics in the series. Yeah, and it's comic, right. but it's black history. They have one on Toussaint, okay. they have one on, on uh, actually, they have a two part for Malcolm, they have one on Harriet Tubman. The, it's I forgot what the name of it is at this moment, yeah, uh, but I, I, I could get that to you. Something like that where they could see there's a Malcolm X graphic novel that's for, geared towards young young readers. Something like that that they need. And it's important that you get them. And they're good for you because you have a core of them. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation earlier today uh, with a brother that's um, dealing with his daughter who's now in her 20s, early 20s. Uh, and she's running with this psychology thing where she hasn't learned anything about Francis Cress Wilson or Wade Nobles, all this. So she's coming with a, the white-minded psychology trying to deal with African people. And so yeah. he's trying to gear from that. But my point in saying that is one of the mistakes that, uh, that um, the, our elders made in terms of they were so busy out in the struggle, the attention was kind of, you know, they had to sacrifice their time with their children. And the children only getting information from them 
where all their friends is barraging them with, as you said, Corvette, Corvette. You can't make an African-centered child by in a vacuum. Every mm -hmm. African-centered child has to compete with the information that's coming at them from their peers that are not exposed to that. So our jobs from my age to your age generation is to make sure that we surround these children with other children that are get, getting the same information because they become the next level of the village that marry intermarries with each other and raises children. Right. And they all have the same values, interests, and principles when they raising their children. You won't have me coming out of uh, like brothers and sisters here in Brooklyn. We got some uh, a school, Uhuru Sasa, that was created by the East. Now, all those East kids, some of them intermarried, but some of them went out into Bed-Stuy, married knucklehead dudes and gold digger chicks. With, and so they're dealing with baby mama drama where they were supposed to be taking the struggle to the next level. We got to make sure that our children are surrounded by a village of children on the same level with them so that they could take it to the next level and their children could take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And being in the school, you have an opportunity to create a little village with the students that you work with and, and get them on the right track and re-Africanize re their mind. Brother Charles? Yes, Bob. Um, uh, is Dr. J ready? Oh, let, let, let me go get him. He was here and then he saw me building with the, the young brothers and he walked back in the room, so let me go get him. We appreciate that though, Brother Charles. Def definitely appreciate that because the re-Africanizing of the mind is, is you know, with bro Brother Dr. Jeffries, it's just that's just what it is, man. So we definitely appreciate that. Definitely. Uh you're welcome. So let me go get him, brother. I'll be right back. All right, brother right. Charles, I want to thank you, man. Um when you come back, I don't know if those comic books, I think there was about 20 in that series, yeah. if they're still available. And if they are still available, uh those things need to be redistributed. They are yeah. excellent, absolutely excellent. excellent. So, exactly. um, you know, it is, if, I'm glad you brought it up. I don't know where you get them. Do you know where you get them? I could, I, I found a, a site that had information about them online a, a few years ago, and I put up a, po a post on my Instagram. Uh, so after I get Dr. J, I'm going to sit through my um and I put up the whole history of the brother that was the creator of the series and everything on my Instagram. That was actually yeah. one of because that's what I do. I use Instagram and Facebook. I don't just put up, you know, once in a while I'll put up some, just something silly because I'm a human being. A lot of times people look at those of us who call ourselves uh, Pan-Africanists or, or uh, Black nationalists and think that we are serious all the time and unapproachable. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just a regular dude. I crack crazy <laughs> jokes all the time. Oh man, yeah, me, I'm the worst. You know, for, for my, my college crew, I'm, uh, the, I'm the worst. And, and my boys, they might tune in, but yeah. But one thing I wanted to mention, I'm, I'm, I apologize for cutting you off. Like, and I know y'all are familiar. Like Kiriku, what B, B knew Kiriku and Fudu, the sorceress. Yeah, Kiriko the Sword, Binu and Finu, and different type of cartoons. Like I have some friends in the UK, and um, and if you notice how the UK is kind of like Cali, a lot of you know it's interracial, a lot of stuff go on. And um, one of them was saying the niece is interracial, or the the, the niece is interracial. And I said, well, still feed them with that with those type of cartoons stuff like that because they didn't even know that they existed. We have all these new black African centered like cartoons and books and stuff like that. And so I'm always, yeah, you know, preaching that too. So that's a great, great point. Yeah, Black, Black Sands Entertainment has some yeah. excellent books that are, yeah. uh, and, and the, the artwork is crazy, crazy. Black yeah, Sands yeah. Entertainment. Yeah. Um, Mail Track. Mel, well, Mel Track, the artwork is not so good, but the concept and the ideas are good. Yeah, uh, but but this, and Black Sands Entertainment has graphic novels and they have films that they're working on. But there's a whole there's a whole cadre. Uh, one of our sons of Africa, Steve, he's put out his own uh, mm -hmm. uh, black comic book line with a uh, and uh, one of the characters I forgot her name right now. She's she's part. She's like a teenager, but she's been recruited into a and in Harlem. This is all taking place in Harlem. There's an ancient order, a, a, a black kind of secret society, kind of. Um, 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 intelligence agency that operates in Harlem, and sh and mm -hmm. she's part of the 
the, her parents were in it before her, and now she's taking up the mantle. I mean, so there's all kind of stuff going on. There's this stuff dealing with the now uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's out now. I mean, when I was in my 20s, there were some folks doing Horace. There was a comic called Horace. There was another one, her rule, and it mm -hmm. was other, but the artwork was kind of, you know, so it was kind of hit or miss. The stuff that these guys are putting, sisters are putting out now, the anime, mm -hmm. the animation and comic mm -hmm. books, man, it, I mean, we, it's right on point. It's right on point. It's it's it's, yeah. it's right in the, in the continuum of where we're going. Our ancestors, the creator, is leading us to victory. If y'all if y'all only know over the last year or so how much like people have always been saying here and there for years that we need to do this and we need to build coalition yeah. and you know saying things, but now with this convergence and people having to take time because of COVID to actually sit down and reassess their lives. Yeah. And, and the way things are going, yeah. we've been moving faster and faster. We, we uh, the Pan African and Federalist Movement, of which I'm the New York State liaison, uh, chief liaison for organization, is trying to get us to a place where we can have a federated African one government by 2030. Brothers, that's where we're going. With a place for every a diaspora, and whether you have direct connection. Uh, by citizenship or or being born on the land to mm -hmm. being a, somebody like me who with several generations in South Carolina and Florida and Georgia. We right. all will have a place right. in the government that we want to build and right. everybody's in agreement. And the Africans right. from the continent are in agreement that the African-Americans should be part of the show on the way because we have some, being here in the belly of the beast, we have a different insight uh, even though all our people are being pre oppressed. Well, I'm sorry. Brother, brother Charles, I'm sorry, brother, brother Charles. Uh, let's let's see if we can get Doctor Jeffrey. Dr. Jeffrey. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, well, it's not right here. Here. It's not important. It's just it's that we had uh, advertised that he'd Dr. be on Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was I was going to ask the brother what what you think about this whole separation stuff going on now, but we talk about that another another time. Like they're trying to they're about trying to segregate. Play out. I mean, like Ados and Ados and FBA. All of that. Stuff. All of that. Yeah. Well, we'll come back. We're just getting okay. started. But tonight, uh, okay. we want to hear Dr. Jeffries talk about Sheikh Anta Diop okay. and the uh, tremendous contribution that he has made in moving this whole liberation struggle mm -hmm. forward. All so, right. uh, and I already told Clemson the other day, uh, last night, I said, Clemson, you got all these young, young brothers and sisters on here. How come I ain't get an invite? What's up, so <laughs> <laughs> So and he's known me for years. He known uh, me for years. I seen that this elder here. Y'all make sure y'all stay connected with him, just like y'all would stay connected to Dr. J. This man has the largest African encyclopedia of of, of video lectures, and, and I mean, he just has indescribable material. Thirty, forty, it might be fifty. Is it fifty, Bible? Yeah, 50, 50 years of information. He's 20, been there. When, hours. He was in Howard Beach when they were in when Sharpton was fat and marching in <laughs> Howard Beach. He was at the Tawana Brawley protest. Yeah, he yeah, was in yeah. Egypt and Kemet with Dr. J and, and Gil Noble and Dr. Ben. This man yeah. right here is a national treasure. If, yeah. if you know what he has, you yeah. would do everything you can to make sure that he succeeds with what he's, you know, the to get that information digitalized and out to the community. And when you mention Gil Noble, that's, um, I often talk about anybody that got platforms, I don't care who it is, like you gotta have a protege behind you. Because when, when, when we lost Like It Is, and for the brother Olaku and uh, Omawali, we had a show that came on on Sundays called Like It Is with Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, until like when we was like, it's like late 70s, early 80s. Sunday at 12 o'clock. You know, the reason why you hear me, or maybe yourself too, Brother Charles, is I know my mom, when nothing going on at 12 o'clock, I was in front of Like It Is on Sunday because we didn't have any type of black programming. And so there's a Bro station. No, we uh, did. Brothers. We did. Brothers. But, but we're going to have another brothers. conversation about okay. that. Let's get let's get uh, Dr. J in the seat. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I know you, that's my bad. Go on in. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, there's just so much to talk about and so much to celebrate. 
So I understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And doing something, and they do need uh, an outlet so that they can could, see birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. And you don't need everybody, mm -hmm. but you do need a a solid core group, and that group mm -hmm. can change the world. And that's what's happening. Uh, brothers and sisters are eager to get on the line, to get on this battlefield. They're eager because mm -hmm. the creator is drawing them. Mm -hmm. And Dr. J is here. Dr. J, thank you, man. It's good to see you. You look good. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a long time. I haven't seen you in person in months and months. So, um, brothers and sisters. Seen. It's good to be seen above ground. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. I'm not so, waiting to be seen in, in my coffin and you're all crying. Oh, he was so wonderful. He tried uh, to do everything for African peoples. I want to hear what you're going to say while I'm alive to critique it. Exactly. And, uh, you know. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Tom. It's all yours. Dr. J is going to talk to us today about the tremendous contributions of uh, Sheikh Ante Diop and the impact that his work has made around the world. He is, uh, he is, he, he, I, I don't think anybody can give us a deeper understanding of Sheikh Ante Diop than Dr. Jeffries, who was very much involved in getting his work, his book, uh, translated from French into English. But the important thing for us tonight is to try to understand what it is that uh, Sheikh Ante Diop brought to us and how it reshapes our thinking uh, as a people. Uh, Dr. Jeffers, would you please? Well, certainly, uh, I appreciate uh, Brother Clemson Brown, minister. Uh, and his contribution. And you know, the creator's not finished with him yet. By all intents and purposes, he shouldn't even be here raising this type of hell. But <laughs> obviously uh, his wife has done all she could, his, his queen to keep him above ground. And then we're ready to help him in any way he wishes us to contribute so that his legacy is real. My wife and I set up a foundation. It's the Doctors Rosalind and Leonard Jeffries Foundation, dealing with what? Legacy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all about. Uh, not just the conflict and the uh, difficulties African peoples have, have had to bear, but dealing with legacy and what it means. And the key point in that legacy, as far as I'm concerned, and the lessons that have been laid down by Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and uh, Dr. Len, myself, and certainly the Africans from the continent, Dr. Shekanta Diop, Dr. Theophil Banga, and the legends of people who have been making this enormous contribution. Once we put that together, we're on the move. And then uh, that's more than the move that was in Philadelphia where they were fighting for uh, the Africa, it's funny that in the Mamiya got caught up into that press, that process, and Pam Africa is still pushing it. And so what is all this about? It's a mission. It's a mission, purpose, and direction. If you do not have that as part of your, uh, of what you're about, then you're not gonna go too far because there's all kinds of systems of miseducation and all kinds of processes of uh, destroying your Africanness in order to find a little place among whiteness. So we're trying to encourage all of our people, no matter where they are now and where they think they are now, to Africanize their lives. That's why we have been allowed to have this information with such an abundance, such a flowering. And when we talk about a Shekanta Diop, a Dr. Parr, a Dr. W.E.V. Du Bois, uh, Honorable Marcus Messiah God, we're not talking about, we're going way beyond individuals. We're talking about schools of knowledge. Dr. Jeffries, I want to know something about Dr. Uh, Shekanta Jip. 
Well, really, what you want to do is to be introduced into his school of knowledge. And uh, I want to be able to know something about the contemporary scene. Well, there are brothers who have mastered the contemporary scene. One uh, African coming up from Mississippi made his way to Morehouse. He survived Negro achievement of Morehouse. Then he made his way to New York and he met people like Clemson Brown and Gil Noble and everybody else, Dr. Clark. And then he was able to master the Jesuit system of definition and misorientation and, and capturing. So he survived miseducation in Mississippi, Negro achievement education in Morehouse, and Jesuit education in New York, either at Fordham or St. John's. The Jesuits had a way of presenting the knowledge to master you and control you. And the, uh, certainly other people who we, names we don't have to mention, they've mastered the knowledge of stealing uh, your legacy and, uh, and allowing you to look at them as the achievers and the, the most important people, the chosen people of the universe. And at the same time, they've put you in a position that you have to now fight for as the cursed of the universe. So these schools of knowledge have provided you with process. If you can dip your toe in it and feel the warmth and the spirit, and then you can, you know, get in, uh, bathe yourself in it, then you're on your way. But if you're just going to dip your toe in it and then pull it out and then go back to white formation and uh, development, then you're in a a situation that you're in a situation that uh, we have to rescue you from. And so uh, I know most of you have been able to master to a certain degree some of this knowledge and you are ready to take off and take on the world, push the elders aside, push the memory of the great elders like Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, push it in the background because you got Solomon the God, and you got who else they got, Charles? No, not so. You know, he means Charlemagne the God. Charlemagne the God. All and, these other folks who and, have uh, and, and mastered the internet and the TV. And <laughs> well, it's a whole host of them. Right. But you've got to get baptized into the African uh, flow of knowledge, and then you can start to decide which avenue do you wish to to uh, take. And uh, so that's why uh, we're glad to be a part of a continuing flow of knowledge so that we can move you away from what I call a paralysis of analysis to an African systems analysis. And once you have that in place, when you see these brothers, you don't see them as competing uh, victims of the system of white supremacy. You see them as people who are growing out of that devastation of uh, Africans are not even human into a full realization that we are the human race. We laid the foundations for all high culture and civilization that's been significant. We built the pyramids. People whose culture is different and who wants to want to claim the pyramids have been involved in what we call the stolen legacy. And one of our great brothers, George G.M. James in the 50s, he wrote a book called Stolen Legacy. And then when we started moving out of the 50s, uh, when Nkrumah and others started calling nations together, the Pan-African conferences and other things, Nkrumah, Nkrumah's Ghana's independence, Ghana's independence was 1957. But you can look at it It was an honest mistake, Charles. Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, Charles, is, my wife is at the other end of the house. She's preparing for her classes tomorrow. She's still teaching. Uh, she teaches two classes on a Wednesday. Uh, she's been teaching at the School of Visual Arts for more than 50 years. And she is brilliant in terms of presenting material that she's mastered. And in fact, she went to Africa before I did. 
Uh, she went in 1960. I had my chance to go in 1961 to the continent, but I met Africa in Europe when I went to study a Rotary International Fellowship. And that's when I met Sheikh Anta Diop and his mentor, Aliun Diop and other Africans uh, that in, in Europe is when I got, I knew that I needed to bathe myself continually into this knowledge that Diop stands at the head of the family uh, in terms of presenting. So he's not just a, a brother who uh, we need to recognize, he's a school of knowledge. And one of the first books he produced was uh, in the 50s toward an African Renaissance. So most of you may not be familiar with that, but that deals with him in the late 50s, the time there was an explosion of independence, 1952 and three, Gamal Nasser and Naguib had a revolution in Egypt. And for the first time in 2000 years, black men ruled in the Nile Valley. And that inspiration of the revolution in Egypt continued in 54, you had explosions all over the place. So black people met uh, in, uh, they had a conference of African and Asian new nations. And so in 1955, you had a continuation of, of this process. 56, you had the independence of the Sudan. 57, you had the independence of Ghana. 58, you had the independence of Guinea. 59, you had independence of of Cuba and the people on the island of Cuba. And in 50, and in 60, you had an explosion of nations independent in French speaking areas. 1960, you had Nigeria independent. So in 1960, the explosion of African power and knowledge was for, in our streets. You had the students began to wake up and marching in the streets. So we have to see what I call the continuous rise of African peoples into what we can say is the African Renaissance. And this is a, a Sheikh Anta Diop's beginning, but he continued to produce until he produced the most significant book among all of the books that anybody can have. And that is Civilization and Barbarism by Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. Translation uh, was by Lawrence Hill Publications. And there was an African brother and Zinga, brother and Gemi, who I actually, since I could not uh, complete the translation of the book, which I was asked to do by Dr. Clark, uh, brother and Zemi, I met him on 125th Street at Dr. Yosef Benyakinen's office, uh, where he sold his books and pr printed up his books. And since I didn't have time to, to finish the translation I was working on, I was able to get $20,000 from the Black United Fund. And that Black United Fund was their first donation uh, to any group. And that money we gave, put into a trust for Ngemi uh, to finish the translation of Sheikh Anta Diop's work, and he did. So what you wanna see is the connectedness, generations of resistance, generations of struggle, generations of revolution generations of laying down the foundation for the future. We see the conflict between individuals, but you need to see how they've worked through their conflicts to produce a movement, schools of knowledge, and more fundamentally to produce a 50 year turning point of history in favor of Africans. And that has laid the foundations for the African Renaissance. So it's not a question of saying toward an African Renaissance, which is what Shepard Diop talked about, he took a great leap into the Renaissance by having this work produced, but he didn't do it by himself. In order to appreciate Sheikh Anta Diop, you have to appreciate the foundations that he stood on. And when you say Sheikh Anta Diop, the great scholar, you have to say in the same breath, he stood on the foundation laid by his mentor, Aliun Diop. And his mentor had a wife, Madame Diop. And they had the courage and the foresight to build an institution that's the leading institution of black knowledge that we've had. And that was Presence Africaine.
They published books. They helped researchers. They helped Sheikh Atadiyap get his doctoral dissertation approved. Very few people have been called upon to produce three doctoral uh, 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 research in order to get a, a degree. They turned him down the first two times. His, mas his mentor was not going to let it happen a third time. In 1959-60, he organized 150 people to come to Paris and to be a part of Diop's uh, defending his work for a dissertation. And it so happened that I was in Europe at the time in Switzerland looking for black people. There wasn't many in Switzerland. And uh, so Spirit told me, uh, go take a break and go to Paris. I said, I, don't, I, I haven't lost anything in Paris. Uh, I don't need to go to no Paris. But Spirit kept saying, you need to go to Paris. And I said, uh, well, I don't want to go to Champs-Élysées to buy some perfume for Pierre Cardin or some clothes. I don't need to go to Pigalle and, and look at those women standing in the doorway say, Monsieur, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? I don't need any of that. I need to find the African way. And sure enough, I went to the student quarters, to the Sorbonne, and there was a fervor of activity Thousands of people were there at the defense of Sheikh Hanta Diop's PhD for the third time around. And of course, there was white scholars there, Marxist, Leninist scholars, Pan-African scholars, ordinary uh, European scholars were there. And Diop was able to... get his... He told me to go there, and I was there also. I didn't have a name. I was just one of the black young men walking and young women walking through the crowds, et cetera, dealing with all of the excitement of the war for the African mind actually taking place. And uh, this area uh, of the Latin uh, quarter, this area has uh, the Sorbonne, which is a pillared temple. And it may have been inspired by the Greeks, but a pillared temple is the tradition gift that Africans have given to the world. And so anybody that uses temples are copying the Africans. And so uh, Diop was there in the Sorbonne. Down the street was the Collège de France. That's where you get your undergraduate degree. And between the Sorbonne, where you got your, your highest degrees, <coughs> or the next to highest, there is a degree above the doctrine in the French tradition, it's called the agrégé. That's even beyond, that's a dissertation beyond. And several Africans have captured that, including uh, Leopold Seda Senghor. He went beyond the normal doctorate to the agrégé. That means you, you are a, a master of the word. And so Diep was lucky to be able to get the doctorate so he can be a part of this tradition. Pillar tradition, the Sorbonne. And between and down the street was the Collège de France, where you got your uh, first degree. And between the two was Présence African Think Tank headquarters, where they did the publishing of their works. And, and uh, they're one of the great think tanks of the world. You can't even get into this African knowledge in a serious way unless you have an appreciation of President African, many of their works, including works by Dr. Clark, have been published in English by uh, President African. I really have to let people know that Diop stands, but he stands on a rock of African greatness. And an example of that, this book is one of his many books uh, that he's completed, uh, The Cultural Unity of Africa and all kinds <laughs> of other things. But when you open the book up, you see his dedication. And this I always like to read in reference to Shekanta, no matter how limited the time. This brother had a deep foundation in his Muslim tradition. He was one of the Maurids. Maurids are an African Islamic world religion. Their holy city is not Mecca. They've founded a holy city in Tuba, in Senegal. 
And so this independent African knowledge coming from the Maurits was the foundation of Shekhan to Diop. He was rooted in that foundation. He mastered it. But since he was a brilliant student, he also mastered the classical education that the French give to their young people. And so he went to the best French schools in Senegal because Senegal was given a special place in the French uh, cultural dynamic, meaning the French were looking for allies and they were looking for people who could support them in their colonial empire dream. And so these youngsters uh, in Senegal were given the privilege by the French in 1848. Well, Dr. J, we hadn't even gotten into our civil war then. That's right. In 1848, we didn't get to 19, uh, 1860 yet. 1848, the French had a revolution throughout the dictatorship and established the Third Republic or the Second Republic. The First Republic was during the French Revolutionary War. And that turned into a disaster because it went into uh, what they call the reign of terror, where everybody was cutting each other's head off. Uh, but this, the third revolution for the third republic, Africans helped the French in their struggle. So they were awarded <laughs> French citizenship. And so the French citizenship was spread not to all of Senegal, uh, yeah, Dennis, we're in, we're in the middle of the presentation. Okay. Now, <laughs> that was one of my adopted sons of Africa, Dennis Allen, calling me from California. Uh, he was one of my students when I set up the Black Studies Department at San Jose State in California. And then when we came back to New York in 1972, and that's when I was asked to head up the Black Studies at City College. And by 73, I had somebody in my class, he looked like he was earnest, he looked like he wanted to, to uh, get some of this knowledge, but he didn't know how to approach a person like me. So he sat there kind of dumbfounded, but somehow the, by osmosis, my knowledge was able to permeate his sinews and he became a, a, a active interested brother. He wanted to be an artist, but once I started combining art, my wife started combining art with politics, uh, with all kinds of cultural dimensions, then he kind of, he got, he got the mood, he got the movement. And uh, 1973, when this youngster was beginning to grow up, he was big, you know, husky guy, and he was ambitious, he had designs and whatnot but he hadn't been baptized into that deep Africanness well that we have to begin to deal with. And the person I'm talking about is your host here, Minister Clemson Brown was sitting in front of me and my wife in her classes at City College in the early seventies. And then that helped Clemson to move into this greater dimension. I know he's not going to give me any credit, but that's the way people are. You know, they take advantage of you. They they are nibbling on the, the breast of Africa, the male breast and the female breast, but they don't want to give us our due. But Clemson and I met, and that was a rendezvous, a match made in heaven, because he has been doing the do ever since. Now, don't you all tell him that I was praising him because he has what you call ego uh, needs. And, uh, but I have to admit that he was one of those students who found his way and began to move through the world with power. Dennis Allen was one of our adopted sons. He found his way. That's the brother who just called me. <laughs> We've got to deal with his wife from Nigeria and he's struggling to bring her into the United States. If he cannot do it, he will go to Nigeria and get uh, citizenship in Nigeria. But Dennis uh, was one of my students in San Jose and he was so correct. We let him live in the house that we bought in 1969. We let him live in it for, for many years, almost five, 10 years. He was able to maintain that house. 
that's the call that I just got. And I told him, call me back tomorrow because we're in the middle of this uh, presentation dealing with Sheikh Anta Diop. But with Sheikh Anta Diop, we want to link him to us as a living entity that's inside the various fibers of our body and not deal with him as some demigod. Uh, he was an ordinary African who had an extraordinary mission. And that's what Brother Clemson is. He don't flag his degrees around, even though he he uh, puts up a question mark, minister, or a, a minister of government, brother, a, a, a minister of the Lord, brother, a minister of government in terms of the army, brother. Are you? No, but Clemson has found his way. And let's all give him a pat on the ass when we see him and saying, thank you, brother, for the work that you have done. And you deserve to be able to finish your work as far as you can in getting those thousands of hours of our history in the, in the, in the formation that we can use it. And then we can be able to, if this is the greatest of our African leaders as an example of coming out of an indigenous education among the Maurits, the classical French education for the best of their students coming out of their lycées, their high schools, and then in 1947 or so, he left uh, uh, Senegal and he went to Paris. And then he met the Marxist tradition and others and whatnot. But then he asked, as he grew in Paris, he met the Africanized nutrition, negritude developed by the greats. Uh, uh, and Amy Césaire, who was an inspiration to uh, uh, Diop and other young Africans looking for their way. And Amy had gone through the European tradition, but he was looking for the return to Africa. Uh, and so that return to Africa was the the force that built the negritude movement that helped Shekanta Diop and a whole host of uh, others find their right direction. And of course, his mentor, Alium Diop, he dedicated this book to him. I dedicate this book to the memory of Alion Diop. You spell it A-L-I-O-U-N-E, Diop, D-I-O-P. No relative of Shekhan Diop, but he became his big brother mentor in the struggle for the African mind. I dedicate this book to the memory of Alion Diop, who died on the battlefield of African culture. Not the battlefield of, of, of communism, not the battlefield of, of uh, fascism, not the battlefield of, of uh, capitalism, the battlefield of African culture. We are fighting to restore ourselves. And you do that, economics and politics helps, but culture makes it real. And so he dedicated this great work to his mentor. Alion, you knew what you came to do on this earth, semicolon a life entirely dedicated to others, nothing for yourself, everything for others, a heart filled with goodness and generosity, a soul steeped in nobility, a spirit always supreme, serene, simplicity personified. Did the demurge, the beginning of, of time, want to provide us with an example an ideal of perfection by calling you into existence, question mark. Alas, the terrestrial community to which you knew how to convey better than anyone else the message of human truthfulness that sprang from the innermost depths of your being was deprived of you too soon. But remembrance of you will never be erased from the memory of the African peoples to whom you dedicated your life that is why I'm dedicating this book to your memory in witness of a brotherly friendship that is stronger than time, period. End of the dedication. Check on to Diop, Dakar, Senegal. So it's not just a book that we're looking for or knowledge, but we're looking for a movement to transform our world. And certainly this brotherhood that they're talking about was an African brotherhood that they put together that others joined. I consider myself a part of it. 
and others who, who joined in, like Theofolo Banga, who was his partner in this African world struggle. And Theofolo Banga came from the Congo, the Congo Brazza, uh, as opposed to the Congo Leopoldville. But the Congo Brazza was part of the French colonial empire. And Theofolo Obanga and Diop worked together to bring the, the death blows to the system of white supremacy and negative Africanism. This book by Theofolo Obanga is called African Philosophy, the Pharaonic Period from 2780 to 330 BC, 2780 AD, uh, BC, oh, A, what is that? The Pharaonic period. Oh, it deals with the BC, the pyramid age, the building of the temples. And, there, and, and he, the Greeks have captured philosophy. These are our brothers taking it back from the Greeks. The Greeks sat at the feet of the Africans to get their knowledge. They acknowledge it themselves. So how if the Greeks of ancient times can acknowledge that they got their knowledge sitting at the feet of the Africans, how can modern day white folks claim that they are Greeks trying to teach us and lead us? Diop and Theophel formed a duo, a brotherhood. And this is the picture of the Valley of the Queens. You see, you have the Valley of the Kings, but when our sisters knew that they are part of a duality of male and female principleness. They opened up the Valley of the Queens. And there is the great temple of Hatshepsut. It's next to the temple of, of uh, Amenhet III, and then her nephew, Tutmos III. So the, the, here is a, a book by the partner of Sheikh Antidia. Now, the interesting thing is, he knew that he had to do what Sheikh Anta Diop told me they had to do. They had to move not east into the valley of the Nile. They had to move west. And uh, people say, Dr. J, what you talking about? Well, let me take a little sip of my apple juice so I can explain it to you. Yep, and a banger. Be a fellow banger, two of our greatest scholars, sitting at the feet of Ali Diop and others, concluded that the rise, the new rise of African people in the new centuries, in the new millennia, was going to come not from Africans on the continent, whether they're talking about Africa, North Africa, or they're talking about the highlands of Ethiopia, or whether they're talking about the, the floodlands of the Sudan, or whether you're talking about Kenya and Tanzania, all the way down to Zimbabwe and South Africa, or whether you're talking about Central Africa, richest part of the world in terms of mineral wealth, or you're talking about West Africa, where you have this cultural dynamics of the Yoruba people and the Beni people and the Igbo people, and or the, uh, the Baule and the Akan people of Ghana and Ivory Coast. What these brothers believed that spirit told them that the rise was going to come from Africans in the new world who've been cut off from Africa, who've been put into a dehumanizing process, and they will bring the word of the new African movement throughout the world. And so he felt that it was necessary for us to go to America to do what? Not to go to Harlem and, and go to the Apollo, not to go to Washington, D.C. and look at the Washington Monument. His, the aim was to go to Africa to link up with Africans in the New World who had this desire to become African because they were dep deprived of it. So they would be hunting for this Africa more than anybody else uh, because they didn't take it for granted. And so that's been the case. Sheikh Anta, the first ticket of anybody to send to Sheikh Anta to come to America was a ticket I sent him to come to City College to be a part of a conference on the international civilizations. And they brought in all the white scholars that they could get. I said, just get me Sheikh Anta Diop. 
and they agreed to bring him in. But of course, in America, we already had a uh, grown and mature Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen and his elder, Dr. John Henry Clark and their elders, uh, Chancellor Dr. Chancellor Williams and John Jackson, the elder uh, in terms of Africanness for Dr. Clark. So we sent the ticket, but Sangor was in a political struggle. The president of Senegal was in a political struggle with Sheikh Anta Diop, and he would not let him leave the country. He couldn't, he could block him, but he couldn't kill him. He couldn't lock him up and then have him killed in prison because politically he was tied to the Maurice community. And if anything untoward had happened, untoward had happened to Sheikh Anta Diop, and it could be blamed on the government of Senegal, the Maurice would have brought the government down. They would have had a aid against the Senegalese government. They would have gone to Tuba and prayed by the tens of thousands, a hundred thousand, and then moved as a million force and destroyed Senegal. So he was able to stay alive because he was part of this spiritual movement. And that allowed him to continue his work. He did not come to America until he got a ticket from my buddy, the spiritual leader of our brother in the African community of Atlanta. And his great work is so uh, marvelous that uh, uh, Asa Hilliard, Dr. Asa Hilliard, and Dr. Hilliard loved Africa. He actually went through a period, I was moving back and forth to the various countries of Africa and whatnot. He spent six years in Liberia, and that was a transformative spirit. Experience because he was in, in the mix of trying to build a new Africa on these African Americans who had been enslaved peoples and then sent back to Africa with, uh, without the wherewithal to really build. But at any rate, they were trying to survive. Asa had a six year experience of helping to build an education system in Liberia. And when he passed us and went to the Great Beyond and they had a boule funeral for him and we had a African funeral for him at, at Morehouse. Asa, uh, in the wake, they had a hundred people on the stage that had come in from Liberia to honor the brother. And we thought we knew him well. He was our, our closest uh, partner in struggle, but we didn't know him deep enough. He never put on his chest that I've had an African experience of six years in Liberia. But when you saw these people from Liberia, a hundred of them there, they had paid their money to come to his home going to let the world know that he put in place a new educational system in Liberia for six years. And that's when he was in Liberia and that system is still educating Liberians as best they could. So even Asa didn't go put his chest out and said, I had a deep African experience, but he continued. And then he became the leader of us to the Nile. And then he hooked up with his cousin, Dr. Jacob Brothers. And then what these brothers did and what we all did and sisters, we created schools of knowledge. There was a New York school. And of course it was built around Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen and his elder, Dr. John Henry Clark. And a whole host of us grew in that context. And then in Philadelphia, you had a school of knowledge to develop. That was where dear, uh, um, our brother uh, from, who wrote the Philadelphia Negro, who wrote the, uh, the W.E.B. Du Bois is, is a school of knowledge. And, uh, and his base was uh, Philadelphia. And then in Washington, D.C., you had the great, like Carter G. Woodson, uh, who never got a PhD, but he taught the PhDs because he built the base at Howard, which was our most prominent institution. And so we're talking about this knowledge being transferred to our people by various schools of knowledge and various processes of transferring the knowledge. It's the most fantastic story in the history of the world that has yet to be fully told. And none of us will live long enough to be able to tell a story. Clemson has physically a part of it, and it's a part not only of the glory of, of Africa and the Nile, Clemson was able to film Daughtry in Africa, Sharpton in, in Africa, when they were going there to put uh, our presence 
in the hands of Africans that were being devastated by civil war and, and disease, famine, and all kinds of other things. So Clemson has footage that nobody has, but he didn't have the courtesy of coming to me and say, Dr. J, I know you've had all this knowledge all these years, even in French and whatnot. You speak a little Portuguese, even try to learn Russian back in the day when you went to Europe. But uh, Clemson has never sat me down and said, Dr. J, could you please help me organize this material and make your contribution to it? And I hope he does that before I leave here and join the ancestors. And those of you who are close to him, let him say, Dr. J is reaching out to you, Clemson, so he can help as much as possible, not to make a million or trillion dollars, which you are worth in terms of the work you've done, but to make sure that that story has the full impact of our people uh, and can raise our young people up into power and help us envision new nations, et cetera. And so we're on a victorious path and you have to be a part of it if you hope to be something. And you don't become it by being an individual. You have to have a family connection and not becoming a radical revolutionary where you can burn down everything. You have to be a radical revolutionary to burn down the things that need to be burned down, but you're gonna to have to be a philosopher, a, a political visionary in order to build from the devastation of revolution. So there's a complementarity of the revolution and the building. Diop represented that. Theophil Banger represented it. Shekhar Diop represented it. Marcus Garvey represented that. The people who came together with Marcus Garvey in 1945 for the Manchester Conference. It says one period of history that you have to master. It's 1945 at the fifth Pan-African Conference organized by English-speaking brothers and sisters who wanted to leave their mark on the world. And I say English-speaking because in the, the, at the same time, the French-speaking world met to organize their world. And that was when they formed what they call the RDA, the Rassemblement Démocratique Africain. That's linking all the French-speaking nations up together in an African movement. So you had the British and the uh, African-American, French, uh, well, you had uh, a limited part of the uh, British connection links up with the uh, French connection. But the 1945 Fifth Pan-African Conference was largely for English-speaking areas. The French people were not out of it because they had a conference organized at, at Brazzaville, I think it was, in which they organized the RDA, the Rassemblement Démocratique African, which is a Pan-African organization of French-speaking peoples. And so even the Portuguese were able to uh, begin to link up the Portuguese relationship that came out of very valuable territory called Angola. And on the other side of the continent, you had uh, Mozambique. So uh, we're saying, brothers and sisters, just don't stop on a little piece and you got a little piece of the action. Look for the larger piece so you can almost choke to death on all of this information and whatnot. All of these brothers and these sisters, and I haven't mentioned enough on the sisters, but when I did say Aliun Diop and his great wife, Madam Diop, they did it in the African tradition of a queen, mother, and a king. And so that's the appreciation that Sheikh Anta Diop had to the legacy given to him. But as we move past World War II, in which the insanity of the European was real and this uh, death on death culture that he had was manifested with a hundred million Europeans in World War II killed or maimed. And this was not the first hundred year uh, devastation they had. You had World War I when these same Europeans went at each other like dogs and cats and tigers and elephants and skunks and all the rest of it. And, a, and they were gassing each other, slaughtering each other. A hundred million Europeans were killed in World War I. And so here you have World War I, a hundred million dead. Not just six million Jews, but you're talking about Poles, other peoples that were killed, French and the Dutch. And then you go into World War II and the same thing continues. Here comes some of that German militarism out of Germany to control the world. And they got stopped. They went to Europe like it was a piece of cake. 
They got the Dutch to submit because they told the Dutch, if you do not submit to the to this Prussian German uh, military consciousness, we will destroy you. And of course, the Dutch, being good Europeans, they said, "Well, this they can't really be serious about destroying us." The Germans gave them a timetable to submit and open up the Netherlands so they could march on to England and cross the Channel, and the Dutch hesitated. They didn't respond. So the Germans, in a hurry, they responded. They took the Luftwaffe, the German air force, and they flew it over Holland. Its two great cities are Amsterdam and Rotterdam, and the capital was The Hague. They took Rotterdam, and in one night or two or three nights, they dropped so many bombs on Rotterdam that the whole city was wiped out. And when the Dutch realized these Germans were nuts, they opened up and they submitted. They said, "We're gonna close up. We're gonna no. We we you you can have it. Don't don't destroy Amsterdam." And so when you go to Europe and you go to see a new city, Rotterdam. And then its sister city, Amsterdam, is the old city. Then you say, well, what happened here? And I'm trying to give you an analysis of the history of the real deal. That German mind, that Teuton mind, that Viking mind uh, that the Germans wrought on their own people. We need to understand that this is, these are European fighting each other like dogs and wolves and whatnot. So that's the history. When I went to Europe, I said, this is the best experience I've ever needed to see them, they're sacred. But Americans, they got the game. The Germans played it on the Dutch and they allowed the... the uh, uh, the on the uh, North Sea and getting ready to make an invasion of England. But then what goes around turns around and the Germans had the same thing worked on them. While they build up an army uh, to invade England and they bombed England and tried to bomb it into submission and England said no. And the bulldog Churchill said, we're not going to submit no matter what you do. The last of our men, women and children will be fighting you uh, before we give up. And at the same time, he was smart enough to do the wolf. But he connected with the free French armies that were in Brazzaville being fortified by De Gaulle. De Gaulle said, I'm not bringing my armies into France, uh, uh, from France into England. I'm not gonna submit to, to the uh, Anglo-Saxon. I have too much pride. And so we're going, we're gonna rebuild the French army, not in France or outside of France. Uh, we're gonna build it in Europe, Africa, uh, sorry, in Africa. The European French armies were sent down to Brazzaville when the African leaders like Ufa Dwani and others said, if you want to rebuild France in order to provide armed forces for them to be able to participate in the future of the world, you got to come to the continent of darkness, to where human beings uh, were living up into trees. That's the European myth. They went to Brazzaville on the Congo, across from Leopoldville, and they were able to take time to rebuild the French armies and not only French European armies, but French African armies. And it was those French armies built by black people and white people that helped to overthrow the Nazis. And so when the Americans came in the picture to bring in our high technology and the, and the uh, planes and the tanks and the, and the ships to cross, 2,000 or so ships crossed that English Channel ready to take on these German dogs. And they did. And they ran them back through Germany. And then they ran up against the Russians coming in from the east. And the German dog was crushed, but ready to be born again, of course. He ain't going to stay crushed. But he was crushed for that period of time. You all got to read history. I love to read history about these Europeans killing each other, poisoning each other. Poison We're worried about the virus now. You had a virus during World War uh, a one that, that laid out a whole lot of people, millions and millions of people. So to get into that history, and why? Because you want to rise. Brother Charles was intuitive enough to go and pull this off of my wall. 
this is the future. This is moving toward the African Renaissance. African leaders formed uh, with Emperor Haile Selassie uh, taking leading in 1963, the AOU, Organization of okay. Africa. What is it? The OAU. Well, I, I usually think of the French, uh, I'm into my French dimension now. The OAU, the Organization of African Unity. And then uh, our brother Malcolm at that time had gone to Mecca and then he was able to go to Cairo and he met the leaders of the OAU in Cairo and he began to see the linkage necessary of the African continent to the larger world struggle. And so the symbol of rebirth and resurrection that Senegal has was asked to produce. The African leaders asked the lead to be taken by Senegal and the other wealthy African leader uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, and uh, between South Africa and Senegal, they got the resources together with other African nations shipping to create this monument. This is us. And uh, Clemson needs to make sure he puts this particular symbol in the in a key place because it's the rise of the black man taking his role in the black family and then leaning on his strength, which is the black woman and the project of her sacred womb is being held up. And that child is pointing to God. And God is saying to that child that the key to the future is the Africans across the ocean in a new renaissance. And so this symbol built by the Koreans, because the Asians uh, do the master building, but designed by the Africans and representing the African philosophy. And you can see the stairs, hundreds of uh, stairs uh, you can walk up and you can go into this rise of the black man getting off of his knees, too much on his knees. You can pray, but so long, but goodness, some churches go into all night praying, get up off the knees so you can continue to struggle. And then some people are too all night on their knees, shooting crap. And then later when they, they brought the disaster on us, black folk are all their knees shooting drugs. In fact, Gil Noble, who uh, Clemson had mentioned as a, one of the greats in filming, uh, Gil Noble did a, a filming of the drug dens that the black musicians were heavy into because that whole system was being done, drugs was being dumped on them. And when, when Gil saw the, uh, the needles and the damage that was done, he said he was a musician and he had a, 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 a jazz a pianist, uh, but he said that kept him on his course of becoming a great uh, movie uh, a journalist uh, than to be caught up into a, a, a temporary high uh, from, look, black folks need a permanent high, and that's in this rise, that's in this renaissance. But the beautiful thing is you can walk up the stairs, and they usually have thousands of school kids on those stairs because they put the podium in front of the statue. And I have been there uh, many times with hundreds of our people. We took 350 at uh, one of the great uh, conferences, Jesse Jackson, all of them came over uh, and was a part of this. But the beautiful thing is, you can go inside of this statue and you can see the great history of our people. The work of Sheikh Anta Diop, when they opened this uh, great imagery, I was there with my wife, uh, the wonderful, talented, the brilliant Rosalind uh, Jeffries. Nana Abibio is her African school name, just like my school name is Nana Kwekujua Ajiman II of the Agogo in Ghana, Akan Ashanti. And so they combined various names, the name of the day. They put some of the great leaders in my name. So it was not done just to be glamorous. It was done to give me a sense of mission, purpose, and direction because you gotta face the enemy and you gotta be prepared to take him down psychologically, uh, mentally, and culturally, if not physically. And so this 
is the rise of the African man and Diop and his Madame Diop. He married a European woman who was a sociologist, was prominent in research in Africa. And they had four or five, I think they had four boys, and all of them were scientists and outstanding. And the oldest one, Mbaki, named after the Moranab, uh, uh, named after the Muslim leader of Tuba, uh, Tuba, uh, Mbaki. Uh, he works with the French nuclear uh, scientific tradition. But him and his wife organized outside of this monument an exhibit of Shekhan Tadiyab's work and the work of his partners like Theophil Banga and the work of others who were impacted by the African Americans, the African Caribbean, the work of Shekhan Tadiyab impacted on Dr. John Henry Clark, the work impacted on Ivan Van Sertema, the work impacted on Asa Hayed, uh, Wade Nobles, the work impacted on our sisters, uh, segment Pat Newton and her associate, Francis Cress Welsing. There has been this knowledge and this power passing through our peoples, transforming them. And so what they eventually did when they closed down the exhibit outside of the monument, they put the books and whatnot, the histories inside of the monument. And you can walk up in the monument and in the lobby there, there are several things you can do. You can cross the lobby and take the elevator 16 stories up through the powerful thighs of the black man, through his, his powerful chest and shoulders into his head. And you, 30 to 40 people can stand in his head and look out on the world. And so this was designed to let black people know you are a chosen people to restore Africa in its primacy, the firstness of things African, the firstness of the human family, the firstness of high culture, the firstness of mathematics philosophy. We need to reclaim it all. And that's what this statue is. And it's not just the man showing his prowess, it's the man and the woman, it's the family. Uh, this is going beyond Alex Haley, who is one of my uh, partners in struggle. I got a half million dollar grant to help him develop roots. And Alex, of course, had the Kunta Kenti holding up his firstborn, his child whispering his name unto God. Uh, this reflects a little bit of that in my estimation. But he also, behold, Charles was able to, to put it, behold, the only thing greater than you is God. You are part of the God consciousness. And so that's what this particular symbol uh represents and so uh we need to appreciate it some people say oh that it's, it's it's not right what's wrong well the woman's dress comes up too too high on her thighs that's true in a muslim tradition it, uh, women are supposed to be covered and it, it wasn't necessary for them to bring that dress up that high it could have come up to her knees however that's a legitimate critique however you don't destroy what this whole thing means because of that that woman is standing there with equal power to be the rock for him to, to lean on. And he, no man has raised a child by himself. You can't raise family without women and without the feminine component of the human family. So this is the restoration. Uh, it's real. And you don't have to fake it. It's there. It's on film. It's, it's celebrated and whatnot. We have been there many times. Uh, the last time I was there, uh, they had a world festival. There's been three world festivals. One was in 66, 1966, and I was there with my new bride, uh, uh, Rosalind Robinson Jeffries, and we spent 30 days in Senegal celebrating their first festival that they dedicated to two special minds that moved among us. They dedicated the world festival in 66 to Dr. Shekhan Tadip, a homeboy from Senegal, but a true Pan-Africanist, and to Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, from the Africans of the New World. And so there was also the third festival was in 1977. I was able to go uh, again uh, to be a part of it. And that's when uh, Wally Shiyanka and all of the other great Nigerian artists were able to show their uh, country and, and invite people to come. We had a group from uh, Milana Karanga, uh, our brother in, in Los Angeles area. Uh, came with a group and participated uh, uh, fully. 
In fact, he, he was like the leader of the African and Americans. And uh, there were some difficulties, but then he just worked through the difficulties. But so they kept that second uh, 1977 festival as a part of our tradition. One of the leaders was a brother called Taiwo Okanati. And eventually he helped to organize the Nigerian festival. Uh, but in the 80s, when I had problems with uh, people, American Euro Europeans, white folks, and they wanted to destroy me, uh, Taiwo was among other African spiritual forces came to join me. And there was no uh, signing, no contracts. There was no, uh, uh, well, we'll pay you. Um, there was just, we are here to protect you. We're standing on the spirits that come out of the Yoruba tradition. This as the priestess of Ashanti that protects the golden stool in Ghana. When the attack came and Raza and I uh, had a, 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 a ceremony, a spiritual ceremony around the bed of one of the sick persons in our group. And uh, Raza, when we heard that there was a, they were tearing down Jeffries, he was the worst person in the history of the world. Rosin didn't get shaky, didn't get scared, didn't call up on no tears. She said, let's form a, form a prayer circle. And she said, we're not going to pull a Jesse Jackson. We ain't going to get on our knees and, and pray. We're going to stand on. We're going to stand up and get the spirit to move us. And so, and then we went over to the priestess to greet her. And somehow or other, she knew that we were in distress. And so she prepared uh her Akan power for us. And even to this day, as I show you my uh, my ring on my hand, that's the four or five powerful rings that she gave us to protect, uh, to protect us. So brothers and sisters, it's real and we have to make it even more real than that. And so uh, uh, we want you to be able to understand that we are the best thing that we've been looking for. We've been looking for white folks to help us out. Now we think that Biden can do it. Uh, uh, is that his Biden. name, John? Biden. 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 <laughs> Biden and Kamala. Well, Kamala has leg legitimate, some legitimate genes in her. Biden has the heart. He knows that it was African peoples. When that senator went in South Carolina, uh, mm -hmm. said that uh, uh, Biden had lost in the New England and other places with the primaries. But the brother said, don't worry, wait till he come to South Carolina. Gonna be a different ball game. And those Geechees of South Carolina were ready and they baptized Biden that you got work to do, that white folks need to do, gonna help you do it, to do to do. And then we Africans gonna do our do to do. And they have done it. There's more women I've seen in leadership position, I cannot believe that these women are merging, organizing, helping us, doing what they did in Ashanti when Ya Asanti was said to the men who were, uh, had not fought when the golden stool was, was insulted by the British. She said, if ye men of Ashanti don't have the courage to stand up and face these British and go to war with them, we women will. And so it's almost as if that is, a, is something that our women have understood that uh, we expect the men to do their share, but there's a share for us to do it. And women have always been in leadership in the African tradition, no matter what part of that tradition you're talking about, no matter what historical moment you're talking about, the woman has been co-equal with the man in making her contribution to the African family. So brothers and sisters, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, get into, look, most of you have been on the sidelines hoping that there would be an African, something to come and save you all. And you all been in swimming in the, in the waters of white folks for all these years, waiting for the mothership to come and take you all to glory. And so, but unfortunately, from what I've been able to view in terms of history, that uh, you can be in that waters hoping for that mothership and hanging on to that log that came off the mothership, the European mothership, to give you a survival. But you can't miss, there is a super vehicle prepared for the future that's coming your way. 
It is the mothership of motherships. And you looking and wonder with your mouth open, you can't let that log of white supremacy that's helping you to, helping you to survive, you can't cut it loose. But cut that sucker loose and jump on the mothership that is bringing the message to us that we are God's chosen. We are what we need for a future. And it is real. It is happening. It ain't fake. It's not Hollywood. It is the real deal. So, brothers and sisters, I could continue on this process of trying to expose some of this significance uh, to you on uh, tonight until uh, morning. I would like to say that the last time I was, one of the last times I was at the memorial, and there were thousands of, uh, of people there, uh, visitors, guests, and then there were thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of children that were there to be a part of it. And uh, the president of Senegal had his fellow presidents there. And one of them who had not been able to make the inaugural of the statue, he was given the privilege of making a special presentation. And so the heads of state were, out, were lined, the scholars and, and concerned African peoples were there. And they asked the leader of the Libyan revolution, Gaddafi, to please address the group. And everybody knows Gaddafi is like some of these professors. They can speak for years <laughs> and years. These professors, they just they, so. I wonder who that is. <laughs> the president of uh, Senegal has said, Mr. Uh, uh, they have a special name for the leader of Libya. And he said, we are proud that you are, proud that you are here with us. Uh, uh, we missed you at the other event where we inaugurated this uh, great symbol of our work. And he said, but we do have a time problem and uh, we would want you to be, uh, to, have, to reduce your presentation. We know that you can go to three to four to five hours, but uh, it would not be fair for us to have the multitude here. Uh, that. So he gave Gaddafi, he was within 20 feet or 30 feet of myself, my wife, my nobles, over to Chaka, a whole host. Of us. In fact, we were sitting next to the 40 to 50 uh, Libyan delegation. We had men and women, soldiers and whatnot uh, that were there to support the leader of the Libyan uh, nation. And he gave, uh, he cut it down. I mean, he he knew what to do. He knew the moment. But he made sure he gave one of the best messages I've ever heard from any African leaders. And I've heard at least 30 or 40 or 50 of them in my lifetime. And he looked at the statue. And he said, this is an enormous, great image of where our future should be together as family. And... Uh, in raising that issue, which we were glad he did, he was going against some of the Muslim tradition that does not see the human figure even in stone and in specially designed as, as something special. So for him to praise it was against the deep uh, Muslim tradition that he, he grew out of. He since expanded that tradition to be uh, more open, if you will, or accepting of certain things. And then he went on to say that we are blessed, but we have to understand our blessing. He says, we in Libya have oil. Those in South Africa have gold and diamonds. Those in Nigeria have oil, sulfur-free oil. And he said, but we do not control oil on the world market. He says, what we need to do is have a relationship with uh, Venezuela, and I'm in I'm in talks with the head of the uh, leader of Venezuela, and we are, have agreed to not accept oil payments except in euros or gold. In other words, we're not accepting the British pound or the American dollar to pay for the oil that is necessary 
for the European American world to survive. So when he said this, I almost peed in my pants. I'm sorry to use that expression because this was a declaration of war and nobody was celebrating life and nobody was prepared to put our armies together for war. war you prepare. You don't just bring it on somebody and some group of people. You have to go into deep, deep understanding of, of what tactics you're going to use and this and that. But he continued. After he finished that, he said that we have an army in uh, Libya. There's an army in South Africa. Nigeria has a big army. We need to pool our armies so we're ready for war. Now, if you get ready for war, you do it behind the scenes. You do it in your secret places. You don't do it before a crowd and the world looking at you. But he did end it with that we have different cultural contributions. North Africa has its cultural contribution. East Africa has its contribution. The highlands of Ethiopia have theirs. And certainly Southern Africa and on to West Africa. So we are culture. We need to create a cultural unity of African peoples. So the brother made one of the most fantastic, one of the most timely speeches of anybody ever. It was unfortunately made from his uh, vision. And there should have been secret society meetings of the leaders behind the scenes and preparing what they need to prepare and then come out to the people and say, we have a message that we are, we are in, in, in dangerous situations and we have to be prepared to stand up and fight and die for ourselves. But the brother made his fantastic presentation, but immediately I was sure that the Western world was being prepared uh, to bring him down and create chaos uh, in Africa, which they have done ever since then. But we're on a victorious path, brothers and sisters. I, I saw uh, uh, as the camera passed a number of faces that I'm glad to see part of us I think I saw Brother Reggie. Uh, he didn't have a smile on his face, so that was Brother Reggie. And uh, I saw others. And Brother Reggie is a superman. He even got oh. the he even got the Gaddafi look. I'm gonna put a turban on him, and then we will have Brother Reggie in that Gaddafi thing. And and Reggie is a warrior fighter. He's an unbelievable brother who knows sacrifice. He's been hurt. He's been stomped on. But every time he gets up and he's ready to go at it. And so he's got that special spirit in him. So we'll be looking for great things. Reggie hasn't reached the point of 60 and 70 years. And Dr. Clark was still doing his thing at 70 years. Dr. Ben was still doing it at 90. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Ben was only able to do it at 90 because somebody like Reggie was able to sacrifice and be there for him. He's paid the price. He hasn't been able to take care of the business of his his immediate family, his extended family, his uh, outreach family. He's been sacrificing so much of his life for us. He did it for me. I know it's the truth. But of course he wants to take advantage of it and say, look, Dr. J, you don't want people to know that you are functionally illiterate. You have been ever since I knew you. And you need us, those of us who have that literacy. And, 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 and Reggie had it. He had it. But he wasn't supposed to tell the rest of y'all that I was financially, I was not, well, financially, I've been illiterate too, because I give my money away. But, but in terms of, because I, money is going to come. I just had a million dollar gift last yesterday. I ain't even going to tell you what it was, but I had a million dollar gift yesterday. So it's not just the money you earn when you work for the corporations or work for these universities. It's what you do with the people. And I had a people donation of a billion dollars. I ain't going to tell you what it's all about. But Reggie, it is something to believe. I even had, Brother Reggie, he, you know, he's so uh, uh, aggressive and he does things when he's not even being told. He had nerve enough to keep a record of the great struggle I was waging not by myself, because we had the Sons of Africa, we had the elders, we had everybody supported us, we had the whole community support us, white, black, white people even supported us. But it's hard and struggle to keep the record. I don't know how Reggie kept the record. I found documents yesterday that had Reggie every date, every speaking, every newspaper, every, I mean, I couldn't believe it. 
I saw even the notes that my brother had told the secretaries, do not let my brother know that there are death threats every day on him. So do not let him see the death threats, but save them. And yesterday I saw the death threats. I got tears of joy now to see the response of our people made with all the death threats. We gonna kill, well, they tried to kill my mother. They did kill my father, but that wasn't a big deal because our grandfather had been murdered by the Klan. So we used to take a death and make it into a victorious march into the future. So we're going to let you go because Reggie said, don't embarrass me by telling no more of my story. <laughs> but <laughs> but it is a glory. Reggie had nerve enough to try to lead 150 people to the Nile Valley not going the normal route, flying through Europe and then going down to uh, going down to Cairo. We had a thousand people, we were taken to the Nile, one of the greatest movements across the world in history. We had to have seven different airlines. I was in charge of uh, the Moroccan airline. I had 150 or so people that included Wade Nobles, it, it included uh, Regent Stamford, it included Queen and Zinga, the president of our organization. And then Reggie took 150, 140 through Air Jordan. And here these people, they thought they're going to see Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark leading the way. And they looked around and they said, well, where's our leader? And Reggie popped up, put his chest out and said, I'm here. The people looked at him and said, we got a boy leading us in this, uh, this struggle, world struggle. And sure enough, Reggie was there. Reggie was there. But the thing is, that kind of built his ego a little bit. And so he felt that he could tell Dr. J, I can tell you when you should wipe your behind and, and what type of toilet paper to use. Now, that's how close Reggie was to us because he was the leader of the Sons of Africa. We were taking a chance that the ancestors had provided him with the wherewithal and he had it. His mother comes out of the bowels of the Africans of Virginia. That's where my mama comes from. So I know that he had a special love and affection that his mama laid on him. But of course he had the difficult situation of the black man coming out, trying to deal with this powerful black woman. My, my mother was five foot, my father was six foot five. You know, uh, that ain't an even fight. But my mother had the smarts, she had the wisdom. She, had, she told him what it was gonna happen with his children. And, what, and his role was to prepare and support her. And, and that's the way it was. There wouldn't have been a Len Jeffries or Marlon Jeffries. Oh, my brother just called to tell me that Hakeem was supposed to be on at 11 o'clock. Huh? I, I don't know. My, the youngest uh, Jeffries uh, uh, son was supposed to be on, probably doing with that Henry Lewis Skip the Truth Gates uh, program. But uh, no, we are serious about this. Put the bullshit down, stomp on it, kick it out of the way, get to the serious deal. And, and nobody can do it but us. And so, uh, and our offsprings. So the Jeffrey's offsprings on my generation come from my brother and his kids, and they are doing it. And then Brother Small's got some young people, even Ark Naughton called me to say, uh, uh, Uncle Lenny, I remember when. So they don't forget. In fact, one of the tasks that Reggie had was to take in 40. Reggie, we didn't even deal with the year before. Reggie took 140 of us. We went to meet the Ashanti King and whatnot. Reggie had the responsibility of my nephew, Hassan. He had the responsibility of James Small's oldest son, Omar. And he had the Malik. And he had the responsibility of Dr. Clark's uh, son. What was his name, Reg? Uh, so, uh, Sony, Sony Ali. Sony. And Reggie had the responsibility of taking care of the sons, of the offspring of, of uh, our, our, our so-called leaders. And so, Reggie, there's no way that we could even thank you. There's no way that we can let you know how, how wonderful you have been as an example. But it's going to be hard. Reggie said, I paid a price. I ain't supposed to pay this price. Well, that's what Nat Turner said, but he paid it, you know. Uh, Reggie said, well, look, I missed out on this. And uh, look, Reggie, that's that's good times that come for ordinary people. Those who are in the midst of trying to change the world, 
They don't worry about that. So you've done it. Needs to be told. Clemson, you got to tell it. Yes. Hey, you got to tell it. So, brothers and sisters, we're on a victorious path. As Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess the favorite freedom yet deprecate agitation are men and women who want the crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the ocean. As many waters. The struggle may be, be a physical one, it may be a political one, but it must be a struggle. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, it never will. Find out, find out what any people will quietly submit to. You found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them until they are resisted with either words, and these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. We are on a victorious path, brothers and sisters. And even if we have some defeats and we stumble somewhere along the line, we will pick ourselves up and continue this marvelous, victorious path. That's it, brothers. That's the, uh, an introduction to Dr. J. We got more stuff coming down the road. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been just marvelous. Um, we will do part two. Uh, I'll get the date from Dr. J. Uh, a lot on the app to go. But I tell you, it's been great. And um, we have the wind under our wings. Brothers and sisters, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Love you all. Hotel.